Um, so my name is Lauren Lau. I am an MS1 in the ultrasound selective. Um, and today I'll be talking about the utility of ultrasound and saline infusion sonography um, in diagnosing leomyomas, uterine fibroids, and endometrial polyps. Um, and so abnormal uterine bleeding affects about 14 to 25 percent of women. Um, and common causes of abnormal uterine bleeding um, include leomyomas, which are uterine fibroids, um, endometrial polyps, and hormonal imbalances. Um, and so today we'll be focusing on uterine fibroids and endometrial polyps and how ultrasound can be useful in their detection and characterization. So uh, uterine fibroids, leomyomas, are a benign smooth muscle tumor of the uterus. And uterine um, fibroids are the most common benign neoplasm of the myometrium. And so one study found that the prevalence of fibroids over the course of 10 years to be about 10%. Um, but another study also found that women of reproductive age um, about had 20% of the chance had um, fibroids, um, but many of them were asymptomatic. Um, and so when fibroids are symptomatic, they can cause heavier menstrual bleeding, infertility, back pain, um, amongst other symptoms. Um, some demographic information about uterine fibroids is that they tend to be more common in African-American women um, compared to other demographics. Um, and so endometrial polyps are another cause of abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, and they are, it's a localization um, or localized overgrowth of end, benign endometrial tissue into the uterine cavity. Um, they have a low chance of becoming malignant, about a 0.1% chance. Um, and they are most commonly found in postmenopausal women. So the reported prevalence of endometrial polyps in a cross-sectional study was about 8%, and it was higher in postmenopausal women, about 11.8%. Um, and it's also um, kind of important to note that both leomyomas and endometrial polyps um, can cause infertility um, if depending on where they're located and abnormal uterine bleeding. And so we'll talk a little bit more about the types of uterine fibroids that exist um, and they're categorized based off of their location. So subserosal fibroids um, protrude into or out of and distorts the outer, which is the serosal surface of the uterus as seen in the picture below. Um, intramural fibroids are confined to the myometrium of the uterus. So more in the middle in the muscle of the uterus. Um, submucosal fibroids develop underneath the endometrium and protrude into the uterine cavity. Um, and it's also, and subserosal and submucosal fibroids can also become pedunculated, meaning that they have a stalk. So in an ultrasound, you might be able to see like the fibroid attached to the uterus um, externally or like internally, which would be the submucosal fibroid. Um, and there's actually further classification up into like eight groups, um, according to the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, and it varies really based off of how far in the spectrum they are within the intra the myometrium or to the serosal surface. So, and there's also a separate classification for abnormal um, fibroid location, like in the cervix, as is represented by number eight. Um, the other image also shows the fibroids in a graphic form. So you can see how at the top, it's a pedunculated subserosal fibroid. Um, and you can also see a more like truly subserosal fibroid, an intramural fibroid, as well as a submucosal fibroid and the pedunculated um, submucosal fibroid. And so let's talk about how ultrasound can be important in diagnosing fibroids. And so depending on the location of the fibroid, um, as well as the size of the fibroid, a fibroid might be palpated on a bimanual gynecological exam. You won't really um, be able to feel submucosal fibroids very well since they're inside the uterine cavity, but one might be able to feel a large subserosal fibroid um, on the on, when they do a bimanual exam. And so one study found that the percentage of women diagnosed with a uterine fibroid using bimanual palpation was about 17%. Um, and it was increased to 25.8% with um, transvaginal ultrasound. Um, it's important to note that this was based off of incidental findings um, and not based if patients were symptomatic. And so um, another study found that if a patient, if a woman was having heavy bleeding, um, a transvaginal ultrasound was about 90% sensitive and 87% specific um, towards finding a fibroid. 
Um, and so it's typically best, best clinical practice to have a point of care ultrasound um, if a patient it presents with abnormal uterine bleeding, as there can be many different etiologies of uterine bleeding, um, such as like a thickened endometrium or the hormonal imbalances. And so it's important to differentiate, even if you have a bimanual exam that makes you think that a patient might have fibroids. Um, and so we can also talk about how ultrasound is good for characterizing other aspects of fibroids if a patient did have fibroids, like whether or not they're vascularized, degenerating as degenerating fibroids can cause pain. Um, it also tells us about their size, um, since you can't really feel if there's an intramural or a subserosal fibroid just on bimanual exam. Um, X-ray is another imaging modality that can be used to diagnose fibroids. Um, for example, specifically the hysterosalpingography. Um, however, the sensitivity and specificity of this test is about 50 and 20% respectively. And so ultrasound is far superior to that in that sense. Um, MRI is another option and it's great at characterizing fibroids, especially whether or not they're degenerating and where their blood supply is coming from. Um, However, due to high cost of MRI um, and that ultrasound is pretty accurate, um, ultrasound is more superior to MRI in that sense. Um, and so there's also an additional high level ultrasound that you could perform um, to detect fibroids, which is the um, saline infusion sonography. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more detail about how that's performed. But when you combine that with transvaginal ultrasound, you have an increased sensitivity and specificity of de um, detecting fibroids. Um, and it's also important to note that transabdominal ultrasound may also be performed to detect fibroids, but it's less superior than a transvaginal ultrasound um, since transabdominal ultrasound, maybe you need the patient's bladder to be full. Um, it could be affected by the patient's habitus. And if the uterus is retroverted, like pointing backwards or um, pointing forward, it might make it more difficult for you to perform the exam. And so when we talk a little bit about the saline infusion sonography, um, I think it's important to note that it's more it's more accurate for intrauterine lesions. So the submucosal fibroids, where the fibroids go into the uterine cavity, um, things like endometrial polyps or thickened endometrium, um, the saline infusion sonography is much better at detecting that um, than a transvaginal ultrasound. And so um, a systematic review of studies from Dynamed compared um, transvaginal ultrasound and saline infusion sonography. And there was quite a bit of range amongst the sensitivity and specificity of um, transvaginal ultrasound compared to hysteroscopy, which is where you insert a scope, a camera um, through the cervix to examine the inside of the uterine lining, which is kind of the gold standard um, or the highest level of um, detection that you could have for fibroids because you're looking at it. Um, and so there was a good range about in its ability to diagnose compared to a hysteroscopy, whereas a saline infusion sonography was pretty close and um, had a good sensitivity and specificity um, compared to hysteroscopy to diagnose intrauterine um, lesions. Um, and so let's talk a little bit more about how to perform a transvaginal ultrasound since it's kind of the first line for abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, and so um, the patient will be in a lithomy position, which is on their back with their knee, knees bent and their feet in stirrups, which is the same position as a pelvic exam. And so you're going to use a um, transvaginal um, ultrasound probe, which is also called an endovaginal probe um, or endocavitary. And you're going to have the indicator pointing towards 12 o'clock, which is up. Um, and the preset on the ultrasound machine would be gyne pelvic. Um, you'll also need a sterile condom or a glove um, to cover over the probe. Um, and so what you'll do first is put gel on the probe and then put the, the glove or the condom over so that there ensures that there's no air pockets, which improves imaging quality. Um, and then you'll put more gel on the outside and then gently um, insert the probe into the vagina with the indicator pointed upwards. And so when you do that, this will give you a longitudinal view of the uterus, which is seen on the image um, on the presentation. Um, and so you can see the endometrial stripe, which is the inside of the uterine lining. You can see the cervix, the myometrium, where you would find intramural fibroids, um, as well as the fundus, the top of the uterus, and a little bit of the bladder. 
Um, when you fan the probe um, medially and laterally, it allows you to visualize the entire uterus in the sagittal view. And you'll wanna make sure you do that um, in the detection of fibroids so you have a complete view. Um, if you rotate the probe 90 degrees towards the patient's right, which is counterclockwise, um, you'll get the transverse view of the uterus. And in that case, you'll wanna fan superiorly and inferiorly to view the entire uterus in the transverse view. Um, in a traditional, like complete transvaginal ultrasound, you'll also examine the ovaries, which are more lateral and posterior to the uterus. But um, since we're this exam is more focused on looking for fibroids, you might not do that for this. But if you're doing a complete exam, you should do that. Definitely do that. Um, and ensure you disinfect the probe after examination. Um, so when we are trying to look for fibroids or endometrial polyps on a transvaginal ultrasound, fibroids will appear as a well-defined, um, solid, concentric, hypo hypoechoic mass, but they can also appear as isoechoic or hyperechoic, um, if, depending on their vascularization or their degeneration. Um, endometrial polyps will appear as like a hyperechoic lesion, uh, and it will into the uterine lumen, um, and it might be also surrounded by a thin hyperechoic halo, um, and you might also see cystic spaces within the polyp. Um, but and again, like since in this image you can see how the endometrium is really flat, it would make it really difficult for you to be able to fully characterize um, a submucosal fibroid or an endometrial polyp. Um, and that's where like saline infusion sonohistography um, can improve on that. Um, so as you can kind of see in this image um, on the right, that the endometrial cavity is like expanded with saline. Um, and so you can see that that's empty. And the one above, you can see the presence of a fibroid. Um, and so similar to a transvaginal ultrasound, um, this will be in the lithomy position, but the timing of a person's menstrual cycle is important. Um, so you'll wanna do this when um, towards the end of the of menstrual bleeding, um, which is when the endometrium is thinnest. So you'll have a more even um, endometrial lining, which makes it easier for you to assess the lining. Um, and it also makes it easier to distend the uterine cavity when you um, insert saline. And so it's also important to note one contraindication for this procedure is pregnancy. Um, since the pregnancy would be inside the uterus, you can't insert water into the uterus. And so it's important to do a pregnancy test prior to performing um, this exam. Um, and so this is performed with two people versus like um, assisting versus a transvaginal ultrasound because um, you'll need someone to hold the probe as well as someone to use a speculum and to insert the catheter through the cervix. Um, cleanse the cervix and insert um, saline. So the procedure in detail is more like you insert the speculum, um, you cleanse the cervical os with betadine, you use a five or seven French um, catheter um, flush, flushed with saline before you insert it so that you're not inserting air um, into the uterine cavity because that would also disrupt your um, examination. Um, you're going to um, inflate the tip of the catheter with a little bit of saline and then help hold it in place. Um, you're going to remove the speculum um, and then like fully like um, distend the uterus with saline um, and then insert the like the probe so you can um, get a full view of the uterus. And then similar to a transvaginal ultrasound, you'll fan the probe, um, rotate the probe so that you get a full view of the uterus. Um, and this allows you to better see um, submucosal fibroids um, and endometrial polyps. Um, some issues you might run into with this exam is if the cervix is stenotic, meaning that it doesn't open because then you can't insert the catheter through. Um, one thing that you can do as a solution is maybe consider cervical dilators, but that can be really uncomfortable for a patient. Um, and so that's something to consider. Another thing is if the cervix, if the uterus is retroverted, you might want to consider using a tenaculum to cervix to possibly like orient this, the uterus, but that can also be really uncomfortable for the patient. Um, and so it's important to take those things into value. Um, and when you're looking at a saline infusion sonohistography, um, a polyp would be more oblong shape and a fibroid would be more circular. And so that's kind of a primary um, characteristic that you would use to differentiate the two. Um, but even then, sometimes with a saline infusion sonohistography, it might be difficult to 
um, be sure. And so in that case, you might recommend um, hysteroscopy to fully um, understand what um, is protruding inside the uterine cavity um, and maybe consider a hysteroscopic removal, especially if a patient is symptomatic with abnormal uterine bleeding. And then um, these are my sources. Um, thank you.